thank you, Doug. Thank you. This is because of you, you know. This is all because of Dr. T. Um, thank you, Hanko. Um, this presentation is certainly not the be all end all. It's not going to be scientific, so that, that's a good thing. Um, but it is important to understand that where the future of forensic science is going, um, the future of crime scene, and um, how we can blend those technologies all together. Realistically, we can get this to go. There we go. It really could be brought up into three letters. P for portability, I for immediate results, instantaneous results, and T for what we call teleforensics. And we're going to talk about each one of those three different areas as we get going uh, in this chat. Please feel free, if there's any questions, uh, to break out um, and ask, uh, rather than hold off at the end, because then I'll forget what it is. The whole idea about portability is to get the lab out into the field. And what ends up happening now is when law enforcement, crime scene techs, police officers, whoever's doing the crime scene, goes out to the scene, they have to collect the information and get it back to the laboratory. Takes time, takes effort. Um, with newer technologies now and, and things becoming smaller, the goal is to get that laboratory out to the scene. Um, many times it may be in the form of a, of a van, um, depending on where you um, or what police department or agency you work for, they may end up with large tractor trailers. Um, it, it's pretty interesting to see, you know, where the money goes and how the money all is gets dispersed as to what equipment is available for uh, whatever technologies there are. So again, we want to get the lab out. Uh, we want to get the lab people, you know. Connecticut, we do such a great job in, in educating our law enforcement personnel, educating our lab people, um, and we even, you know, profess to get our lab people out of the lab and come to the scene because, again, the lab people really understand a heck of a lot more what's going on or even what could be going on as far as collecting of evidence and understanding what you can do with that evidence uh, than the average law enforcement or, or crime scene tech. And sadly, we don't do that here in Connecticut. Um, it, it's just, it's a rare circumstance when our lab people actually leave the lab uh, to go to a crime scene. Um, you know, sadly, the, 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 when you have an incident so, so heinous as what happened at Sandy Hook, in that instance, you'll get the lab people out. But on the, and I, I don't mean to, to be demeaning, but on the average run of the mill homicide, our lab people don't, uh, don't come out. So again, we want to get those small things big things to become small and get them out. The, the, one of the bigger pieces of technology out there now um, is called Raman spectroscopy. And what this is used for is we're able to take this small device and we're able to excite something, whether it's a, a powder, uh, an explosive, um, or some, maybe some innocuous material. And try to get some information right then and there. So not only is this going to give us portability, but it's also going to give us instantaneous results. Um, if you've read in the paper just this past week, Governor Malloy received a couple of letters with white powder in it. So the problem then becomes, what do you do from a security standpoint? Do you evacuate the entire building? Do you block off an area? Obviously, we need to take the biggest precautions necessary. And we don't have an an immediate answer, we may have to wait a while. Or we do what used to be done um, and just kind of worry. So we can take this technology and um, point it at our powder, our chemical, our potential explosive, and get some results almost immediately. See, in the old days, we called the bleach team up. And, and it's funny, I googled bleach um, images, and this is what came up. So, I, I, you know, I guess it's some sort of new anime kind of thing. Um, but uh, in reality, this is what really happened. So what would happen is in the, in the olden days, and when I say olden days, I'm talking, you know, that last decade, um, those, those olden times back in, in 2002, 2003, 2005, um, when you had a white powder scare, law enforcement, DEP, DEEP, um, Hazmat, whatever group came out, FBI, ERT came out, 
they would take that envelope with that white powder and they would immediately douse it in bleach because bleach kills everything. Well, not only did it kill everything, but it also destroyed any kind of potential evidence that we might get. So if you were to leave fingerprints or DNA behind on that envelope or handwriting on the letter saying, Governor Malloy, we hate you, or whatever information it would be, it's gone because the bleach would destroy it. Now with this technology, we can determine whether or not it is in fact dangerous, and more often than not, it is not. Um, and we had an incident even here at the university years ago where somebody sent um, a noxious chemical uh, to our PD, and they just opened it. Um, but we could have checked right then and there and determined that it either was harmful, not harmful, uh, made the determination, and if it was harmful, do what we got to do to make sure everybody's safe. But in the interim, if it's not so harmful, that's just as much of a crime. And then we actually have some evidence to follow up and hopefully attempt to uh, effect an arrest on it. So we have ramen. The next piece of equipment that's out there is called FTIR. Now, generally speaking, FTIR in the laboratory is a large piece of equipment. Thanks to technology, it's now been minified, if we can use that word, um, made much smaller so that we can actually make it portable. Take it to that crime scene. Now again, one needs to look at the cost of all these things. Um, not every police department is going to have it. Um, maybe not even state police agency is going to have it. Maybe not even federal agency is going to have it. The important part is that it's available for law enforcement um, to utilize. So with the FTIR, again, the nice thing about it, uh, a little bit different than the ramen, is that it's good for liquids and solids and gases. Because again, not every bad chemical out there comes in a powder form. Um, what's nice about the FTIR as well as the, um, the ramen is, again, we can differentiate not only the, the, the hazardous material, but also narcotics as well. And from a street perspective, um, that's important for law enforcement to understand. Um, so again, we can use FTIR. Um, the nice thing is, again, it's small enough and portable enough that a hazmat team can go in wearing proper precautions, proper safety features, and make that determination as to whether or not it's safe or unsafe and make that information. Portability along with instantaneous results. Homeland Security, big concern, big growing area. You know, how long would it take to sweep container ship coming in from some port across the ocean? Well, with portability, we can take the FTIR, we can take the ROM, and we can scan these large containers or container ships for hazardous materials in a relatively short amount of time versus either A, not doing it, which could lead to potential uh, dangers in and of itself, or um, doing it in quarantining these material for days, weeks, months, until it gets dispersed to um, vendors and then ultimately to you. So again, portability allows us to do this on a, on a relatively quick, um, quick turnaround. This is a piece of actual equipment that we have in our laboratory, the FTIR, the Traveler. Um, it's relatively small, uh, again, gives us uh, instantaneous results. When I say it gives us instantaneous results, look, any of these all of these devices are only as good as what you have in the library. We have a great library here. It, this is only as good a library as we have the material in which allows people to go and do research. If we can't put particular items of information into the library, the database, of these devices, they're worthless. So again, this is something that we can carry with us. Um, the downside, it operates on electricity, 110. It's not por truly portable in the fact that we can take it on a battery and walk into a crime scene and analyze something. But um, again, this is about, or was, about $12,000 when we first bought it. Um, obviously, the handheld ones are a little bit cheaper, a lot cheaper now. Um, and even this is old technology, and this is six years old. So um, take our white powder, 
put it on our little sensor, take our little diamond, run it through the device, and hopefully come up with a, a match. Um, and again, great for white powders. Um, many times the, the white powders that are sent are either chalk dust or gypsum or something, baby powder, talcum powder, and not uh, anthrax or uh, um, other types of, of noxious chemicals. One of the newest pieces of equipment out there is something called uh, DSA uh, TOF, direct sample analysis. So we can actually put something in. It would give us, again, that very quick instantaneous result. It's portable enough. Um, it allows us to look at things quickly. Time of flight mass spectrometer is a separate device. The two go hand in hand. So again, we can put in our suspicious chemical, our suspicious item, or our sample, our question sample. Um, you see that we can look, for your, you know, look at urine for drugs. So from an employer standpoint, now when you go to the employer, many places ask for urine samples. They then send it to a laboratory, and you have to wait days or weeks before you can get a result as to whether or not Home Depot is going to hire you. This federal agency is going to hire you. This police department is going to hire you. Now with this, it's almost instantaneous. Um, when you start to look at you know, performance enhancing drugs, again, same thing. Athlete gets tested. It gets sent out to a doping agency. The analysis takes place. At some point later, the results come back. Again, nearly instantaneous. The athlete, you know, should this device be available at the location, athlete urinates, cup is then passed properly to the next person for the analysis, imported into the device, and as long as the library is set up for either, you know, some sort of PED, human growth hormone, illicit drug, or even some of the newer designer drugs, um, you know, without getting into a whole lot of detail as far as, you know, the legalization of drugs and should we legalize and then change. There's always some chemist someplace who's coming up with some new formula, some new analog to change a chemical to allow it to be marketed for euphoric purposes. Um, so this DSA uh, TOF is, is a relatively new piece of equipment. Again, it's relatively small. Um, not quite yet at the stage where it's truly portable, um, but in combination together, we can determine relatively quick whether or not you're using marijuana, you're on cocaine, you're taking human growth hormones, or you're doing some sort of performance enhancing drug to make you um, better uh, than the other athlete next to you. New, one of the newest pieces of technology out there. Ground penetrating radar has been around for, for a long time. Uh, so this is not new technology. This is a new use for older technology. Um, we are one of the few places around, and I, for, for the sake of the argument now, I'll call ourselves a, a, a law enforcement agency uh, in that regard. Um, but we do use our ground penetrating radar somewhat regularly here. Um, and certainly the call for service has come in. And I'll tell you, um, uh, tell you about a case that we worked on uh, in this past May. So what our ground penetrating radar does is, well, let me go back to the olden days. Jimmy Hoffa, right? Jimmy Hoffa gets, becomes missing. And whatever story you want to take, you can go dig up Giants, the entire Giants stadium looking for Jimmy Hoffa. Um, big place. How do you know where to look? Well, we'll just dig everything up. You see, the general populace can't do that. Um, there are very few federal agencies that have the money and the time to go in and take Giants stadium and dig it up or grab a whole house and dig it up or some large field and dig it up. Uh, it takes a lot of money, time, and resources. What we can do with the, with the GPR, the ground penetrating radar, is we can scan a particular area based on information. So if our witness says, hey, look, I observed something, or I heard a story of, 
we can then take this ground penetrating radar, scan a particular area, and if we find an anomaly, we can say, okay, here's an anomaly, let's concentrate our efforts over here. Oh, there's an anomaly over here, let's concentrate our efforts over there, as opposed to randomly digging, or worse than that, digging everything. So there's some really neat um, uses now on the forensic side for a product that's been around for years, more so in um, uh, engineering, archaeology, um, designing, um, surveying. So again, older technology, new forensic use. Here we have our good-looking guy with our little device up on North Campus uh, practicing. Sir? Peter, is the device, has the GPR been used in a water environment that is put on a hovercraft or some of the boat to look in a lake or a river? I'm unfamiliar about lake or river um, out in the water. Um, the more common technology for that would be sonar, which would be the, you know, the, the cousin, the sister to that. Um, with this, we're going we're gonna to need that surf, that hard surface to bounce the radar beams down. With the sonar or the side sonar, you know, they'll scan um, using a boat. They'll drag the sonar. And they'll, same idea. They'll bounce the waves off it, try to find an anomaly down below, and either dive or send a submersible down to, to retrieve. But same, same idea. Um, some issues that we can, you know, we'd, we'd face with this is depending on where you are. Obviously, when you have a nice hard surface, the beams go down and bounce back. When you're dealing with a surface that has a high water table, you start to get a lot of interference with the GPR, which you know, may be a problem if you do it, did it on the water. But all that we're going to do with this is we're going to drag it <coughs> in a serpentine pattern, marking our, our spots. So where we come upon, um, well, I'll come back to the case in a minute. Where we come upon an anomaly, we'll mark a little flag, put a cone, and we'll continue on. Well, I'll put the, put the real FBI guy up there instead of the good-looking guy. May, um, this past year, we got a phone call from the FBI. The FBI had information um, from a jailhouse snitch that his celly who was a gangster, was involved in the largest art heist in the United States history, $500 million worth of art at the Gardner Museum in Boston. And that he had taken these Vermeers and other um, expensive art objects, rolled them up in PVC pipe, and buried them in his backyard. Good information. So what they did was they went in, and rather than dig up everything, we dragged the GPR throughout this guy's front yard and backyard. In the backyard, we found three different um, important areas. We were able to map, and, and it's hard to, there's a shed. Actually, right this area right here, um, as we dragged it, we were able to map out this linear line another linear line, another linear line, and the completion of the rectangle. Any idea what it might have been? Old Pretty close. The guy used to have an in-ground pool that we didn't know had been closed up and just bulldozed in. When the FBI went to talk to the family member, he said, oh yeah, my dad had a pool back there that we just closed off. So we were able to map the outline of the pool. Now, again, couldn't tell you what it was, but we know that there was something there. Further on, um, on the property, um, well, let me go back. Further on in the property, the, there was a slope in the backyard that led to Interstate 84. And what he did was, through his downspouts, he attached piping to draw the water away from the house and down the hill. We were able to find that underground piping. We found two large rocks, no artwork. 
So we worked outside. While we were working outside, the FBI and the Connecticut State Police were working inside. Because the other bit of information was that he had built a false wall. And in that false wall, he had placed the artwork. So what they did was, this is called FLIR forward-looking infrared. It detects heat. Now, the neat thing about it is, and, and certainly not new technology and, and not for this lecture, is we can find all sorts of cool things, um, tracking people, uh, any place where there's a heat exchange and you're hotter than the average air around you. We can go in and, and use the FLIR. Um, most police helicopters, law enforcement helicopters, military helicopters, or oh, bless you, all operate on FLIR. This is nice because it's a very small handheld device. It's a couple of thousand dollars, very affordable for most agencies, and works like a charm. So in this particular case, what they did was they brought in these large heaters. And they'd have one team on this side of the wall holding up the large heater, while the other team was on the other side of the wall with the FLIR, looking for some sort of anomaly in the wall. Now, obviously, when you have two pieces of sheetrock and a stud between it, you can see where the stud is because the temperature difference between the two pieces of sheetrock is different than where the stud is. But if there was a false safe or a false compartment, theoretically you would see where something would be hidden. So in our particular instance, we looked at it for artwork, but the use is, again, drug dealers, gun dealers, people who hide things. Great search tool to allow us to go in and search rather than ripping every wall down, ripping rather than taking apart entire factories or buildings. So there's some really, really neat stuff. And again, this is the, the, um, the images that you get. You can see the temperature differences. Different temperatures register different colors. Where you start to see anomalies, you can do your searching. Um, this was utilized years ago by a police department out west that they would drive by people's houses. They had information on a particular home being uh, used as a um, marijuana grow operation. Uh, using marijuana grow, they use grow lights. Grow lights are hot. They would drive by with the infrared. They'd find this house that was starting to glow. Most people's houses don't generally glow. Um, they hit the house based on information. They found the grow operation. U.S. Supreme Court overturned the search as an illegal search because they didn't have proper protocols in place in which to do so. So there are some precautions out there by Supreme Court preventing law enforcement from just spying or, or invading your privacy. Um, but when we have the legal right to be there, and the FBI in our case in Manchester had a search warrant, we had the legal right to be there, Certainly, the, the, um, the use of these devices are permissible under the, the search warrant. So, and again, just to show you, um, you can start to see the differences in the studs in the wall as opposed to uh, the normal ambient temperature, ambient area around it. So, some neat stuff. Um, it was amazing how probably within 30 minutes of the police, FBI, um, secret FBI teams that wouldn't tell us who they were. Um, I, I, I'm going to guess that they were their, their um, uh, computer intelligence folks that travel at the truly you know, moment notice. Um, helicopters were by. News media from as far away as Boston and New York showed up. So it was pretty neat uh, once you got done and uh, on this little quiet uh, quiet curve, the amount of uh, news media that was out there. They did find, however, in the shed, they found a compartment um, and an old um, tupper, big, large Tupperware tub that was empty underneath a false floor. So again, maybe it was there. Maybe they got tipped off. Maybe the wife had something. Who knows? Uh, we just never found the artwork. The next item up there is something called X-ray uh, diffraction. Again, different technology, uh, portable, brings us to the scene. And again, based on what 
we can image um, based on what the x-rays will excite, gives us a different spectra. The spectra can help us determine uh, what the different uh, items uh, might be. And again, the nice thing about this now, now we're starting to expand it a little bit, uh, paints and pigments. Um, so again, here we are uh, at a motor vehicle accident, a hit and run. You have a pedestrian hit. Maybe you have some big property damage. Paint is always, there's always some sort of transference of evidence. And in, and in our particular case here, we'll use car paint. Car paint is made in multiple layers. We'd have to pick that up, send it to the laboratory. The laboratory would have to analyze each layer. We can then determine based on that, whether it's a Ford or a Chevy, we can tell you that the color of the paint, a lot of information, months, maybe years to get us that information. We can take the x-ray, the frag, and get us that information a little bit quicker, get it out to the scene. Um, again, we start to deal with you know, terrorist activities. The explosives are certainly a very key critical component now um, with all the different uh, types of, of incidents that have occurred. Um, again, we can get that information quickly. We can get the lab out to that scene, to the airport, to wherever it is it may occur. Gunshot residue, GSR, again, very nice. Um, GSR, by nature, is a very fragile bit of information, a fragile bit of evidence. By having this device available, instead of having to analyze and wait, we can possibly get that information very quickly um, to determine who might have handled or was near a firearm. And again, um, it is only as good as the spectra we develop, which would be in the library, and then your ability to match the spectra. So you still need training in it. Um, it wouldn't be for the average law enforcement officer. You'd have to have some training and knowledge with all of these pieces of equipment along the way. Which leads now to I need to know now. I can't wait. I need to know now. So in addition to a lot of those things, having knowledge now, we can go on to uh, other types of, of identifications. Tattoos are a great way to identify somebody. The downside is, I'm not quite sure there's a tattoo database out there where we can figure out who's who. Worthless. So let's come up with some equipment. Well, the olden days, you know, 25, 30 years ago when we stopped your car because we caught you weaving or bobbing, we'd have you roll down the window. And you guys, especially if you're a college student today, you know that smell of stale alcohol. Well, I use my little sniffer here, and I would smell that stale alcohol. But you see, that's not good enough. So we would have what were called PBTs, preliminary breath tests. So we'd shine a little flashlight in your eyes. You'd breathe, and it would register on my little flashlight, these little lights, saying, ooh, there may be some alcohol here. That's pretty cool. Well, that's great for alcohol. But not everybody drives drunk who are driving intoxicated. People smoke marijuana. People take cocaine. People take other drugs. Those flashlights, my nose, wouldn't work on that. So they started to develop these narcotic sniffers. So again, it would require you to breathe into this device. And again, we would try to match up what you're breathing out with the information in the device. And if we can get a match spectra, Possibly we can determine that you have recently smoked marijuana, or we can determine there's cocaine, or some other type of drug that is starting to come out through your breath. Again, I know right then and there, here it is. Um, make the arrest, and then follow up later on by sending your blood, your urine, or breath um, to the laboratory for uh, complete analysis. The, um, one of the, the, this is Kaylee Anthony. Um, when her mom was on trial, the prosecution tried to introduce evidence of a device that would be used to sniff human decomposition. 
The question then became, in the courts, would it meet a Daubert or Fry hearing? And, and Daubert or Fry very quickly is, does it meet ex, um, accepted science? Does it meet standards of the day? Well, this is technology that's, that's, that's new, that's kind of out there in the reach. And the court ruled that it didn't quite meet the standards that we accept today. Five years from now, 10 years from now, who knows? But for today, it's not quite there. And some of the concerns are, um, there's been a, a bunch of science done um, where they've been able to develop 478 different compounds within decomposition. So if we can identify some, all of those compounds, hey, maybe it really can measure decomposition. The problem is, is that only 30 of those are related to animals. Well, what are we? We're, we're animals. So we need to be able to fine tune this a little bit better. The other concern is smell. If you're bored one day, and this thing, I believe, blooms only once a year. If you're bored one day, head up to Yukon, because Yukon has one of these plants. And they say that when this plant blooms, the odor is so decrepit, so close to decomposition, that people faint. So maybe now my defense is, hey, guess what? In the trunk of my car, I was transporting one of those flowers. So again, for everything we can bring out, we can always find a defense for it. Now again, way out there, way out there. But nonetheless, possibilities exist. Our three dirty letters, do not ask. Um, everything is concerned with D DNA. Everybody wants to know right now what, you know, is it that person? In fact, back to that Kaylee Anthony case, they found her body on a Thursday. One of the very first questions the news asked on that day was, is it her? Is it her? Did you match the DNA? Well, they just found her skeletal remains. How are you going to find out right then and there if it's her? Now, again, something different if we had something that, you know, you had a tattoo, my name is Pete Massey. Okay? Maybe we had a driver's license on me that had my face on it. Looks like me, Pete Massey. Still, I wouldn't believe it because all of us bald guys look alike. So we still need a little bit more definitive information before you make that positive ID. We can check our DNA, right? Problem is this. We can do real-time, what's called PCR, real-time ampl amplification. We can get that information real quick. All that that real-time tells us is Instead of having to send it to the laboratory and waiting for the end result to happen, we can watch the results happen. We can get some information as that amplification is going on. We are still years away from determining um, what's going on. So again, what we can do is we can observe that process. We can see what's happening. What I think is going to end up happening first is this. We're going to end up eliminating people. So what I believe is going to happen is we're going to end up taking swabbings or some sort of non-invasive DNA and we're going to run it through our real-time DNA thing when it happens and instead of telling us that it's you what it's going to tell us that is that it's not you which for law enforcement is just as important because if we can exclude you then we let you go live your life move on I think that's where we're going to head first. Maybe the technology will get there where, where we can get DNA results relatively quick. Back to Kaylee. Thursday they found her body. They didn't have positive DNA results working around the clock until Sunday. So we're not quite there yet. If you want a job, go into biometrics. Huge brand new area. Um, one of the largest growing areas of Forensic science, uh, I'll even go so far as saying engineering. Um, common use here in the States. Anybody been to Disney World recently? 
Nobody's been to Disney World? Yeah. So when you went to Disney World, did you, and you had a big pass, you allowed you to go to multiple parks? Fast pass, not the fast pass, the multi-park pass? Yeah, was your name on that card? Yeah. Okay. What happens if you lost, go ahead, say it. Yeah, you had to put your fingers in a device. So it scanned your identification and matched it to that card. So should you lose that card? I couldn't pick it up and use it. It would only register it to you. Real use biometrics. Well, good news, bad news with military action in the Middle East. A lot of money and effort has been placed on um, identifying terrorists, identifying um, friends, identifying foes in the Middle East. <coughs> Again, huge military is, is really leading the charge on biometrics and it's slowly filtering down into law enforcement's hands. Um, it's slowly filtering down to become affordable. We're seeing this in our daily lives. Safes now have thumbprints. Entryways, thumbprints, fingerprints. Um, went out to dinner at a restaurant in Wallingford. And in order for the gal to open up the cash drawer, she had to put her thumb on the scanner to make sure that it was her opening up the cash register. Definitely cool stuff. That's biometrics. So how can we use it? Facial recognition, okay? We can scan an audience. <coughs> we can scan a stadium. We can scan New York City. If we know that you are a terrorist and we can have your information into our database, we can scan wherever. And if we see you, we can notify somebody. Great information. Great tool. Now again, you can get into that argument, big brother, or not. Um, I know that a few years ago they used this at the Super Bowl. So inherently you bought your ticket, you gave implied consent. You want to come to the Super Bowl? We're going to scan you. Um, again, by matching up positions of facial characteristics, you have a signature appearance based on the biometrics, fits into a database, do the analysis, and sure enough, it's Pete Massey. Um, I'm just thinking, Hanko, I, I got a, a, another story maybe someday we can do on Abraham Lincoln from friends of mine. Um, pretty neat, based on some biometrical stuff. So again, you're out in public, um, you're in a, a, an environment where it's a, a, a private environment, a sealed environment, such as basketball game here, a concert at the casino. Again, we can do the scanning, find out who you are, and make the comparison, and try to identify you, whether, again, you're a friend or foe, whether or not there's a warrant out for your arrest, whether or not you're on a wanted list someplace. So again, there's some really good stuff that we can utilize towards making an identification. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I don't think it would fall under biometrics. Mm -hmm. um, it's a whole separate, I think it's a whole separate category, much like a fingerprint. Yeah. Um, I feel like that's been around for a while. That's been around for a long, long time. They've expanded that a little bit where now they use voice stress analyzers. West Haven PD mm -hmm. has a voice stress analyzer. Um, so that if, if I were to start to question mm -hmm. you on something yeah. uh, where you didn't do it, your biological or physiological reactions are going to be different yeah. than if you're trying to hide much like a polygraph. Yep. Um, and again, it's very similar. It's not accepted into court, but from an investigatory perspective, hmm, there's a little check mark next to it that says, I need to dig a little bit deeper into you to figure out if you're involved or not involved. Um, but again, under stressful circumstances, registers a little bit differently. Um, you know, again, maybe one day we can get West Haven PD up here to do a demo. I mean, there's some, you know, one thing leads to the next thing, which leads to 15 other things. Um, this is a really cool product. Um, again, 
came out of the Middle East uh, incidents. What's nice about this Fusion product is this. We have a scanner, much like I just talked about with that gal at the restaurant, where we can take a live scan of a fingerprint. So if I have you personally, I can put your finger on it, scan it, send it off to APHIS, which is the automated fingerprint database operated uh, by a state, or more importantly by the FBI, in Parkersburg, West Virginia. Is that good? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Senator Byrd. But um, nonetheless, if so if we have you, we can scan you. Well, that's great. See, that stuff's been around for a little bit. But what's nice about this fusion is I can get to a crime scene. We can dust it. We can process it using some sort of technique and have a developed latent print. I can take a picture with the camera of that developed latent print. And if it's of sufficient quality, send it wirelessly to APHIS. And as long as you're in the database, and many of us are, um, even though we've never been arrested, or those who have been arrested, we can come back. Now again, this is a little bit futuristic by showing up you know, your face on there. But again, it gives us an idea. Now we're never going to make a positive ID based on APHIS. You should never make a positive ID based on APHIS. You still need to be able to pull an inked print and make a, a, a human eye-to-eye -eye comparison. Um, however, it's going to give me what I need, which is probable cause, to either arrest or detain until such time as I can get the fingerprint to make that comparison. Um, neat stuff, affordable, about $2,000, which is not outside the realm of many police departments. Um, neat, neat, neat stuff. Some of the newer, more freakier things out there, uh, vein technology. We're going to pass infrared through our fingers, through our hands. Um, there are certain features of ours that are unique for us. Our ears, our retinas, um, shape of our lips, fingerprints to, to the greatest extent, footprints to the greatest extent, DNA to a large extent unless we run into a problem. And what would that problem be? You're science, you know that. How about non-science people? What do you think? Identical twins. Identical twins. Why? Why identical twins? Because he said it. Sure, always listen to a guy because a guy's going to tell you. Why? Why identical twins? What's the key word when you say identical twins? Identical. They're identical. They have the same DNA. So there's some problems there. West Haven had a case years ago where they had identical twins involved in a homicide. And... Um, both of the guys are, are legitimately nuts. They were found um, uh, insane by the courts. They're both locked up um, in our psychiatric facility here in Connecticut. Um, but their DNA was found that they, they killed. The CIA had implanted chips in their brains, which forced them, told them to kill the wife of one of the twins. So they sliced her throat with a broken beer bottle. Now again, Whose DNA are we finding? The victim and a suspect, right? But if the suspect has identical DNA, which suspect is it? Brother A or Brother B? Fortunately, they found a fingerprint on the neck of the beer bottle. And they knew which brother utilized the beer bottle. So, pretty interesting. So DNA is not the save all that uh, everybody thinks it is. Um, but needless to say, the vein patterns in your hands are relatively unique to you. Biometrical techniques, okay? We can look at the vein patterns and make identifications. Again, we're assuming that you haven't had any kind of hand surgery. We're assuming that you haven't had a hand transplant, that medical science hasn't changed you in some form or another, or an accident has changed you in some form or another. So again, we can send the information down, capture it on a device, and store it into a database. Now again, we're not quite there yet. Um, I don't know anybody whose vein patterns are included in a database someplace.
but it's there. The technology is there. It's just a matter of are we going to adopt it? Can we adopt it? Will it meet Daubert and Fry um, and become acceptable? The last group that we'll talk about is teleforensics. We were one of the first around to, to work on it. In fact, when I came here in 2003, we were finishing up or working, almost finishing up a grant that we got from, I believe, NIJ through NASA, or NASA and NIJ, on teleforensics. What teleforensics is very quickly, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, is the ability to transmit. Henry's a great guy, Dr. Lee. I know of only one Dr. Lee. As much as Dr. Lee will work 27 hours in a 24-hour day, there is still just one Dr. Lee. So how can we get Dr. Lee to go to all of these crime scenes? Well, heck, man, we can sit Dr. Lee in an office someplace, and we can bring all of those crime scenes to Dr. Lee through teleforensics. Well, that's great. Now, back in the day, 2003, the way to do that was through wireless devices. The problem is, with wireless devices, if you lived in upstate, anybody live in upstate New York? Anybody live in the mountains, of, the hills of Connecticut? Mountains of Connecticut, hills of Connecticut. How great's your cell reception? Mm, not, not, yeah, not very good. So there's a problem. So let's say we had our crime scene in the Catskills, or up in Torrington, or Canaan, or someplace in Connecticut, Torrington, where cell reception is awful. And that was the problem we had. So we ended up looking at sat, satellite. Well, 10 years ago, the cost of a satellite phone, the cost of satellite time was very expensive. And it got to be that while the technology was there, the funding, the amount of money needed to operate it quite, wasn't quite readily available. However, again, in the technology. So if you watched um, 10 years ago, a satellite link, you saw the stochastic movements because the bandwidth wasn't so smooth. Nowadays, you watch satellite transmission from across the world, and it's like it's next door. So we've evolved to that process where not only is the technology better, but the cost has come down dramatically. So again, um, what had happened was New York State had developed a truck that allowed satellite transmissions. Um, it was really pretty cool. The problem was, was they couldn't get the waves to bend corners. They couldn't get the waves out of a building. So they spent a million dollars on this grant to develop this truck that sat in a parking lot because it didn't work. That's science. Sometimes experiments work, sometimes they don't. So again, went to satellite, satellite works. Um, side phone costs are down, makes it much easier. Take our phone, take a picture, transmit it up. Um, Again, should you have cell service? Um, we were just down the American Academy meeting last week, and uh, a former colleague of ours uh, here at UNH did a project with her students in which they used cell phones to take pictures of developed fingerprints and wirelessly send it to APHIS. Now, they were using older cell phones um, where megapixels were you know, in, the, in the ones and the twos and even the threes. Nowadays, the iPhone 5s and the iPads and some of the newer um, Android type phones, the megapixel, um, megapixels are greater. The greater the megapixels, the more uh, in-depth the photos are, more detailed the photos are. Again, makes it much easier to be accepted into APHIS. Pretty neat experiment. Um, it's there. It's just a matter of, are we going to do it? Um, our earliest technology was we had a, a group down in Houston. And what they did was, again, very similar to what we can do today. With the Go cameras, the, the smart, isn't the Go? GoPro cameras. They stuck a GoPro cam camera on an old military helmet. And through a wire, through a wire, they wandered through the house documenting. Well, now we can do that wirelessly. The changes in 10 or 12 years make a big difference. new stuff out there, UAVs, okay? Um, unmanned, air, unmanned area vehicles, drones, 
A lot of police departments are starting to use them. Some civil liberty issues um, that are being raised. The biggest problem, though, with the UAVs, depending on how high they go, you need FAA clearance. So we'll get Dr. DiCarlo, who is a, a pilot, and we'll have him fly our, uh, our UAVs around here. But again, police departments use them. Government uses it. Um, a lot of the secret agencies within our government uses them. Um, a lot of foreign governments use them. They're there. I know of a police department in, um, and again, just some of the smaller ones. I know of a police department in um, Arizona. What they're doing is they're using them to um, document car accidents, traffic accidents. So they'll float the UAV above and they'll photograph the traffic accident. Again, they're having some issues with FAA uh, as far as, as that goes. Um, my dream, my goal, is to take a UAV and put a scanner on it. Now again, this scanner is too big. The technology isn't quite there yet to get the scanner down. What the scanner will do is we can set this scanner up at a crime scene and we will rotate through and through a laser it will measure millions of points. So we can grab right now, if I want to get the distance from myself to the camera, I have to either use some sort of sonic, some sort of laser, or a tape measure. If I don't get the measurements to myself to the bookshelf over here, I've lost it. What the scanner will do as it scans, it will grab millions of points. So if I forgot to measure from my di myself to the bookcase, I can just go back and call it up. So again, my, my hope is, is that we can get to a point where we can get the scanner small enough attach them to the UAV so not only do we photograph but we can also scan and with the ability of gyroscoping we can hold that UAV at a steady point and do that again think about it we had this horrible crime in Newtown we had to send obviously first responders in then we sent the second and the third and the fourth waves in to do the crime scene documentation we're exposing those people to, those, to that awful scene, number one. Number two, we're awful also exposing those people to potential contamination. If we can get this scanner small enough, attach it to that UAV, you can have that one UAV operator sitting in a vehicle sending that scanner in and photographing that crime scene or photographing or scanning that crime scene and be able to do that without the risk of sending in 20 or 30 people to be exposed to the psychological trauma on top of the issues as it relates to contamination. So again, that, that's, this is my hope and, and, and we've been talking to, some, uh, to the folks at Leica to try to get it small enough. Um, and again, we're not quite there yet. UAVs are there, but Leica's not quite there yet. And again, this is one of a, an image that you can get off of that scanner. So pretty detailed, pretty neat stuff. The last thing I want to talk about um, before I finish or open it up, would be um, event data recorders. Again, new technology for forensic science, traffic accidents. Most cars now have uh, CDRs, crash data recorders. It knows how fast you drive. It knows when you put your foot on the brake. It maintains your driving habits. You know that, that commercial where you see flow with that little like USB device? That's what that is. So if you drive relatively well within the speed limit for long periods of time, you're a low risk, insurance rates go down. You don't drive so good, you drive fast all the time, flow knows that, and your insurance rates go up. This is built into the car. So that should there be a traffic accident, we'll pull the black box and start to look at when you apply the brakes. How fast were you going? Other types of information um, about the driving history of that vehicle. Um, a few years ago they had a double fatal accident down the road um, with two people killed uh, involving the police officers. One of the things that they did use was the crash data recorder. So again, if you're an engineering person you want a job, learn how to decode those 
and interpret the physics behind that, you get yourself a guaranteed job because there are very few people out there right now that have the wherewithal and the knowledge to decode uh, the CDRs. So, uh, almost every car now has them. So you just don't know where they are. Kind of like the old low jack, you know, you put the little tracking device in your car. So there's a lot of neat stuff out there. And with that, the fat lady has sung. And um,